In this screencast, I'm going to discuss chemical shift and fat suppression. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to describe and identify type 1 and type 2 chemical shift artifact. And you should be able to describe the different forms of fat suppression that we use and the shortcomings and benefits of the different types of fat suppression. So let's talk a little bit about the physics of chemical shift. So water and fat protons, despite both being hydrogen protons, do have slightly different resonance frequencies due to their bonds. So water uh, has oxygen bound to hydrogen, and fat has carbon bound to hydrogen. And that results in a slight separation in their layer more frequencies or their resonance frequencies. And that slight separation can cause some artifacts, but it can also be harnessed. At 1.5 Tesla, that separation between the frequencies is 220 hertz, and at 3 Tesla, it's 440 hertz. When we think about type 1 chemical shift artifact, it is really a misregistration of protons due to that difference in their layer more frequencies. So we are spatially localizing protons based on their frequencies. And so when you have a slight difference in protons, but you're making the assumption that all protons have the same layer more frequency, then you're going to have a little bit of misregistration. And so while when we look at this diagram, you can see that the actual relationship okay, here of these protons it creates a circle because <clears throat> the fat and the water are slightly different. Our assumption being that they're the same, when we generate our image from our signal, we have a little band of misregistration. So some dark band on one side and a bright band on the other. And because this is a spatial misregistration due to their frequencies as opposed to their dephasing, then this band of misregistration is going to occur in the frequency encoded direction. When we think about in an opposed phase, this is a way that we can harness this difference between fat and water to actually differentiate structures that have fat in our diagnostic imaging. So even though we have both structures start out in phase after our initial RF pulse, that different speed of precession causes them to slowly separate and eventually they will become out of phase and that out of phase at least at 1.5 tesla occurs around two milliseconds and then they will come back together now they're not perfectly back in phase but instead of having their signals cancel each other out their signals sum together and therefore we describe that as in phase so here they're opposed phase here they're in phase and at 3 tesla because the their difference in layer more frequency is different based on the magnetic field they're exposed to or it's double at 3 tesla compared to 1.5 tesla the TE we need to catch the fat and water protons opposed phase and in phase is divided by in half to one millisecond and about 2.15 milliseconds. When we look at how we exploit type 2 chemical shift artifact for clinical imaging, we see the type 2 chemical shift artifact on the opposed phase image. You can recognize an opposed phased image by the India ink artifact that you see at interfaces between fat and other soft tissue or fat and fluid. Chemical shift 
artifact is going to occur on a post-phased image when one voxel or one pixel has an equal amount of fat and water, what we often refer to as microscopic fat as opposed to a solid area of 100% fat which will not lose signal because it doesn't have an equal proportion of water and fat to cancel one another out. As the fat content within a soft tissue approaches water, you will see progressive loss of signal until that fat and water are equal and it will essentially look black. If you look at the images on the right side of the screen, you'll see an opposed phased image and notice how the interface between the muscle and the subcutaneous fat has this etching of India ink or a black line outlining the structures. That's your chemical shift type 2 artifact. In clinical imaging, we frequently use this to detect hepatic steatosis or to detect fat within various lesions like a lipid-rich adenoma. We can also exploit this difference between water and fat to create fat saturation. When we're trying to create a fat saturated image, we are going to apply a pulse to the image that is going to eliminate the ability to excite a particular tissue. So if we want to saturate out fat, we apply an RF pulse that is targeted just at the layer more frequency of fat as opposed to a RF pulse that would contain the bandwidth of both water and fat. One issue with chemically selective fat saturation is that it requires a, a precise knowledge of the layer more frequency of the tissue you're trying to saturate. And therefore, any inhomogeneity in the field, meaning a different magnetic field than the 1.5 or the 3 Tesla that you're assuming you're at, will cause loss of fat saturation. So this chemically selective fat saturation is best when you have a small field of view and there's very good magnetic field homogeneity or the magnetic field is consistent throughout the field of view. Another form of fat suppression or fat saturation that we can use, which we previously discussed on sequence diagrams, is inversion recovery. Inversion recovery relies on intrinsic T1 properties to create fat suppression as opposed to relying on a homogeneous magnetic field and differences in water and fats layer more frequency. What we do when we're creating an inversion recovery image is we apply a 180 degree inversion pulse initially. That inversion pulse causes our protons to move from being aligned in the z-axis, in this case creating a z-value of plus one, and it reverses their orientation so that your z-value is now negative one. So it doesn't create transverse magnetization, which would be represented by a z-axis of zero. The protons are now going to recover their longitudinal back magnetization moving back to a z value of plus one. As they move back to a z value of plus one, there will be a point based on each tissue type where their z value is zero and therefore they are spinning in the transverse plane but do not have transverse magnetization because they are all dephased. If we apply a 100, I mean a 90 degree pulse at that null point or that point in which the Z value is zero, our 90 degree pulse will not 
excite that tissue type. Because if you remember, a tissue type has to have longitudinal magnetization to be excited and placed in phase in the transverse plane. So if we apply our 90 degree pulse at the null point of fat, muscle and water will have some longitudinal magnetization and then therefore will contribute to our signal, but fat will not have longitudinal magnetization and will not be able to contribute to the signal. So we're able to suppress structures with fat and therefore create an image that is fat suppressed without having to rely on a uniform magnetic field. Inversion recovery is therefore effective for large fields of view where it's hard to have a very homogeneous field. It's also better if there is any sort of metal or an arthroplasty or other object in the patient or near the patient that is causing magnetic field inhomogeneities. A couple issues with re inversion recovery are that it's unreliable for post-contrast imaging. And that's because gadolinium works by altering the T1 relaxation of water in the presence of gadolinium, and therefore extracellular and intravascular gadolinium will make somewhat unpredictable changes in the intrinsic T1 relaxation of a tissue and you can accidentally suppress enhancing tissue. So we have to rely on chemical selective fat suppression for our post-contrast T1 imaging. Also, you are losing some intrinsic signal because you have incomplete recovery of the longitudinal magnetization of your muscle and your water at the time you apply your 90 degree pulse and so chemical selective fat suppression can give you a better signal to noise ratio. This is just some examples of what can happen after contrast. You know when the, these are T2 weighted images after gadolinium administration and the gadolinium causes such rapid uh, relaxation that it's very difficult to get much contrast differentiation because the T1 relaxation of water is going to approach that of fat. Also, enhancing structures, if they have gotten a relaxation time similar to fat, may be suppressed and won't be bright like you would expect them to be on a T1 weighted image if the T1 relaxation has shortened similar to that of fat. So again, we're not going to really want to use inversion recovery sequences after contrast administration. I know these are difficult concepts and I am making some conceptual leaps to try and simplify them. In summary, type 1 chemical shift is a spatial misregistration due to differences between protons bound to carbon and protons bound to oxygen, or protons in fat and protons in water. Their layer more frequency is slightly different. That slight difference in layer more frequency causes spatial misregistration because we are assuming when we generate or construct our image that all of the protons in our field of view are processing at the same layer more frequency. And this spatial mass registration occurs in the frequency encoded direction. Type 2 chemical shift also exploits that difference in procession or that difference in layer more frequency between fat protons and water protons. And we use it to either sum the signals or the signal contribution from fat and water protons or to cause the signal contributions of fat and water protons to cancel each other out. And we do that by imaging at different TEs.
Inversion recovery is not exploiting type 1 or type 2 chemical shift to create fat suppression. It's exploiting differences in T1 relaxation between fat, water, and soft tissue. It's not dependent on the magnetic field, so it's good when there are inhomogeneities in the magnetic field, when there's a large field of view. But it can have problems with poor signal to noise, and it can also be difficult to predict the impact of inversion recovery if you've administered gadolinium. So in general, you want to avoid inversion recovery sequences after administration of contrast.